So Good. I commence? Yeah. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today, but I'm hoping uh, to be there on Thursday and Friday. And um, let me say right off, although um, Benedict and I are separate panelists, we're going to give a unified presentation. And um, we've sort of taken our remit here to be to try to deliver the view as we see it from contemporary philosophy of mathematics. And maybe then I'll just start out with one sociological observation there. And that is that there is perhaps a similarity or an analogy that can be drawn uh, of the situation of philosophy of mathematics or philosophers of mathematics with, as you might put it, the rest of philosophy and mathematical logic and the rest of mathematics. Namely, that we philosophers of mathematics are in some sense on the outskirts or we're outside um, what most people take to be the core of the discipline and we're sort of outsiders looking in. But maybe doubly on top of that, um, maybe engagement with computability theory and reverse mathematics isn't really core to contemporary philosophy of mathematics either. So people like Benedict and me and some of the others of you who are there, we're sort of even outsiders to philosophy of mathematics. So we're delivering that view. And uh, in that spirit, um, we wish to highlight uh, three of uh, what I will call points of engagement um, between philosophy of mathematics and reverse mathematics. And the first uh, I will describe, uh, this, Steve has already mentioned this, the um, precisification or uh, analysis of the famous foundational programs or standpoints of the 20th century, such as finitism and predicativism. To the extent that there has been philosophical engagement between philosophy of mathematics and reverse mathematics in the past, it's been primarily on that theme. Our second point, so that maybe is slightly backward looking, right, as a point of engagement. Um, second point of engagement, um, perhaps related to the subject that philosophers would describe as ontology or the study of what there is, um, in particular, uh, in regard to trying to make uh, sense of the question, what is a set existence principle, um, and, and ask you know, questions like, uh, are such uh, set existence principles always subsema of comprehension. So uh, that does engage to some extent uh, debates that have been going on um, in regard to philosophical engagement with uh, set theory for a while, um, but um, perhaps there's a distinct notion of set existence that's particular to math, math reverse mathematics and that's one of the things that Benedict and I are indeed most interested in. Um, and then maybe a point of engagement for the future. And in fact, this will be the subject of Benedict's talk on Thursday. This is a kind of message we wish to deliver to the center or core of philosophy from our perspective on the outskirts of uh, philosophy of mathematics. Uh, we wish to formulate the question, how much mathematics is used in core philosophy, um, by which we mean subjects such as metaphysics, epistemology, political philosophy, et cetera. Um, and in particular, we're interested in the strength of the principles used in core philosophical arguments and whether these can be measured by reverse mathematical to tools. Um, again, Benedict will say much more about this, um, both in his the second half of his presentation today and then on Thursday, but perhaps some focal questions here are from the perspective of philosophy. Uh, how can the tools of reverse mathematics be used to measure the degree of, as you might put it, idealization that is used uh, in philosophical arguments? Um, and maybe the compatibility uh, of certain arguments with the uh, perspective or the standpoint known as nominalism, which uh, denies the existence of mathematical objects, um, strangely possible, uh, popular amongst core philosophers. But then from, from the standpoint of mathematicians, um, we're also hoping that our program might be a source of new reversals. And again, uh, Benedict will be talking about this. So we're going to split this right down the middle today in the sense that I'm going to talk about the isms and the first half of set existence. And then Benedict's going to say a bit more about set existence and uh, our reverse philosophical program. So here goes. And this really, I think, takes off right from where uh, Steve uh, was uh, talking about. So. Um, 
a major goal, uh, I think it's reasonable to say, of philosophy of mathematics, um, really since the middle of the 20th century, has been in some sense the clarification or the precisification of the standpoints or programs which figured in the famous foundational debates of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and of course, these go by names such as logicism, finitism, predicativism, intuitionism, and constructivism. And then, um, at some point um, in the develop, fairly early in the development of mathematical logic, I would say even in the 1930s, starting with Bernays, you hear people uh, actually um, giving voice to the view that these programs, which were of course originally described informally by the original authorities, such as Frege, Hilbert, Brouwer, Poincaré, uh, Bishop, etc., cetera, um, can in some sense be characterized or analyzed uh, in terms of formal axiomatic systems. Um, but because Claims of this form, right, are uh, like this. They say something like informally uh, characterized foundational program uh, is equivalent in some sense to formal theory. Well, on the left hand side of that equiv symbol, we of course have an informal notion. So uh, claims like this presumably don't admit to formal proof, rather they uh, can perhaps be analogized to Church's thesis where we might try to adduce certain kinds of philosophical arguments in their favor, um, but uh, pre presumably not actually, we're not out to uh, precisely prove a theorem. Um, okay, but then uh, as will be well familiar to, I assume almost everyone in the room and online, we find uh, the uh, following table in the first chapter of Professor Simpson's uh, Subsystems of Second Order Arithmetic, which does in fact suggest a uh, correspondence between um, formal systems in the left-hand column and uh, standpoints or programs in the middle column and then associated with particularly historical figures. And what I'm gonna say, and this is all I would say rather perfunctory and old hat on the coming slides, uh, largely comes from this 2017 paper I co-wrote with Sean Walsh, which uh, essentially just looks at what's behind the table. And maybe before I switch to my next slide, I do just wanna say that when someone of my generation or of our generation actually just starts to follow references in subsystems of second order arithmetic, it just becomes evident or impressed on one the extent, uh, the immensity of the amount of both foundationally directed mathematics and non-foundationally directed mathematics is somehow organized or collated uh, by subsystems of second order arithmetic. So um, it's really, truly a remarkable achievement, just the textbook for which we dearly thank you. Um, but in any event, um, I'll say first, um, and this again follows the scheme of Steve's uh, presentation as well, a quick word about uh, finitism, uh, first in regard to printed recursive arithmetic and then to RCA not and WKL not, and then I'll say something quickly about predicativism as well. Um, okay, so one way to approach this program is that uh, any reverse mathematical program um, is always going to be relative to some uh, identified uh, base theory. And um, so you can think of the program as being uh, parameterized in the base theory. And depending on the goals you want to achieve with your reverse mathematical theory, there might very well be reasons to uh, select different base theories. Uh, but uh, one kind of story that can be told um, ultimately about RCA not as uh, a base theory, of course, relates originally to the relationship between primitive recursive arithmetic um, and uh, the program known as finitism associated with Hilbert or Hilbert and Bernays. And roughly the idea in this right general frame is that when we're proving reversals of the form base theory uh, proves a uh, theorem if and only in principle, we uh, want that by equivalence maybe to be accessible to everyone in a potential foundational debate. Um, and so in other words, uh, right, the idea is that if you accept the base theory and can prove the reversal in the base theory, then uh, if you uh, accept the principle, then you've got to accept the theorem and conversely. And so for this reason, it makes sense to think of a base theory programmatically as one that's going to be accessible to all parties, again, in the foundational debate. And then um, history or sort of 
received history teaches us that finitism is supposed to be the strictest or minimally committed of the traditionally identified foundational programs. And maybe that's a view that you really can trace all the way back to Bernays 1935 paper on Platonism in mathematics, where you can look at as the origin of this way of right looking at things between the relationships between uh, formal theories and foundational programs. So then as Steve uh, has already alluded to, um, there is this very well known right both in reverse mathematics and in philosophy of mathematics argument due to William Tate that um, Finitism is uh, equivalent to uh, primitive recursive arithmetic, or to state it slightly more precisely, and this is the way Tate puts it, that the finitist functions are precisely the primitive recursive ones, and the finitist theorems are those uh, precisely those derivable in the formal system we now uh, denote by PRA. Um, I myself am a big fan of Tate's thesis, um, partially historically, but then also as a, uh, I think, successful piece of what philosophers would call uh, conceptual analysis. Um, but uh, it's important to add the caveat here that um, with respect to the foundation, or excuse me, the historical um, accuracy to the detail, um, if you just read the first two chapters of uh, the first volume of uh, Hilbert and Bernays' uh, Grundlag in der Mathematik, um, it really sounds that like they're giving this conceptual analysis uh, there. In particular, they're telling you a story about how primitive recursion can be regarded as an intuitive process of, as they put it, constructing and deconstructing number signs um, by a certain form of familiar computation. And then on this basis, they are arguing for the finitistic admissibility of quantifier-free induction, and thus ultimately a form of primitive recursion, which they do get around to introducing as a formal system in about chapter seven. Now, if one looks more broadly than this, however, some complications do emerge. Um, in particular, uh, right, so whereas PRA is first put uh, forth as an analysis of um, what Hilbert and Bernays exp uh, call, and this is for them, I think has to be understood as an informal notion, um, recursive Zollin theory, recursive numbers theory. Um, so they're first putting forth PRA as a candidate for this, but as they go about developing the two volumes, um, recursive uh, Zollin theory uh, successively evolves into a system that they uh, refer to as Z mu, which is very similar to piano arithmetic, but rather than having uh, an induction scheme in it, it actually, uh, or being actually by an induction scheme, it rather has a least number operator in its object language and then a form of a least number principle in it. But it will then have the same theorems as first order PA. So maybe that's one complication. Again, they're associating this with recursive Zollin theory. Um, they ultimately also remark that there is no exact separating line uh, distinguishing um, finitary uh, and non-finitary forms of evidence in mathematics. And then um, various uh, subsequent authors, uh, in particular Wilfred Sieg and Richard Zack, have drawn attention to the fact that there are various points in the development of what we now refer to as the, uh, as the Hilbert program, or at least what took place in Göttingen in the 1920s and 30s, where recursion uh, beyond omega to the omega, right, the ordinal of PRA, is used, um, in particular in Ackerman's um, consistency proof for PRA, and then in Bernays various discussions of Gensel consistency proof for PA. And so I'll just finish this bit by noting that maybe there are in fact even other options for first order components of base theories. Of course, everyone in the audience will be familiar with RCA not star, whose uh, first order component is EFA or I delta not plus X. But then since I actually have uh, some background and interest in computational complexity theory, I'll just very briefly allude to Stephen Cook's program of bounded reverse mathematics. And in a way you can think of that as uh, taking something like uh, buses S12 as the base theory. Okay. so. Moving on from uh, the relationship between PRA or finitism and PRA to uh, the relationship between uh, finitism, RCA0 and WKL0. First, actually, I would say a 
really important piece of background to people who are sort of coming from core philosophical logic or philosophy of mathematics. Um, so uh, it would even be an understatement to say that uh, second order logic, um, this you know, discussion of its proof theory, semantics, et cetera, um, and significance has been a very important portion of uh, a number of contemporary debates. So, and here I mean pure second order logic. So it's a reasonable question for philosophers, I would think, what is the, actually the origin of pure second order logic, say, as distinct um, from both first order logic, set theory, and type theory? Well, the answer to that uh, seems to be uh, that it was first introduced in Hilbert and Ackerman's uh, textbook, Grünzüge de Theories and Logic, um, first published in 1928, where uh, second order logic is indeed distinguished from type theory. Hilbert, as many of you probably know, had a brief kind of flirtation with logicism type theory, but then uh, basically uh, became frustrated with the axiom of reducibility, and then came to realize plus or minus that second order logic uh, and arithmetic was indeed sufficient for the development of analysis. So um, they identify second order logic as a uh, distinguished formal system in the first edition under the name of Stufen Kalkul, but then in the second edition, they do a little bit better job of formulating it. Uh, they rename it the predicate calculus of the second second stoof. Um, and there you actually find a formulation of the full comprehension scheme uh, for second order logic. Second order arithmetic, on the other hand, there's a you know, received and sort of largely correct view that it is indeed formulated in the second volume of Grenblagender Mathematic and is something like the theory that's used in um, Supplement 4, where uh, Hilbert and Bernays actually take up the task of uh, developing analysis um, formally. And um, I will just, this sort of relates to some things that Sam said this morning, in fact, note that um, the plus or minus really results from the fact that um, the system H that they ultimately work in, um, it really it, it isn't based on comprehension. It's really a form of the second order lambda calculus with the arithmetical signature. And so, oh, sorry, lambda calculus, I meant to say epsilon calculus. And in particular, they don't identify subschema of comprehension. Rather, they just give some kind of, they have a principle for turning, for turning explicit definitions into sets, which they repeatedly make use of, but they don't distinguish subscheme of comprehension. One more note here is that essentially contemporaneous with this, Bernays was working on his five papers in which he develops the system we now know as Godel Bernays set theory. A lot of these are actually devoted to studying what you can do in various subsystems. And maybe in, I think, the third of the papers from 1942, he develops an ana analysis in uh, GD without infinity, which is, of course, very similar to ACA not. So it's not such a stress to say that ACA not really is the theory that is in the background um, in uh, Hilbert and Bernays as well. Okay, a quick word about the status of uh, comprehension uh, and RCA not with respect to the original Hilbert program. So remember uh, Hilbert's original concern from on the infinite um, was with uh, infinite uh, objects in mathematics to core. He remarks, you know, they're not to be found either in reality or in thought and uh, treat, wants to treat them as ideal elements. So uh, the concern there is with cardinality and not with complexity. Um, but, um, well, of course, anachronistically, we have a good story that I think Steve told that relates um, the uh, goals of the Hilbert program vis-a-vis -vis its instrumentalism um, via the uh, Pi Zero Two conservativity of RCA naught over PRA, and of course, ultimately WKL naught as well. But one more perhaps note from close reading. Um, so, uh, the second volume of uh, Gunnlagender Mathematik was written after Bernays, or kind of contemporaneous with, but then largely after Bernays had come back from visiting Church and Cleany at Princeton. And there really is quite a bit of treatment of the very early stages of computability theory in it. So they are at various points um, in the development sort of 
flagging instances when they want to reason um, arithmetically, um, in involving arithmetically definable sets, but they have some kind of trepidation or allergy to applying the law of the excluded middle to reasoning about sets that aren't, um, they would just have said computable, Breckenbar, um, but delta zero one definable. So there is some, I think, sensitivity um, to, well, maybe uh, it's okay to posit the existence of decidable sets, um, but then um, when we move on to uh, ones of higher complexity, then um, maybe we're going beyond finitary reasoning. Okay, a very quick word about the status also of weak Koenig's lemma in um, the original Hilbert program as well. Um, again, of course, right, WKL naught is pi zero two conservative, so uh, per Steve, finitistically reducible to uh, PRA. Um, okay, so Koning in his 1936 uh, graph theory book um, already observed at least some of the implications um, from, uh, well, of course, he was just calling it his infinity lemma, and he, the, the restriction to binary trees came uh, much later in the 1970s, but he's already observing um, implications like the like Koenig's lemma to uh, Heiner Burrell, and he's uh, also clearly aware of the fact that, um, in a way, his infinity lemma is a kind of universal compactness style principle. He even remarks that it's the, I think, the expresses proper foundation for the Heiner Borel covering lemma. But Hilbert and Bernays themselves, they don't mention the uh, uh, infinity lemma, but Bernays does prove uh, a formalized form of Gödel's completeness theorem in the second volume. And um, there, it seems to me that much of their engagement centers around this issue that goes back to the Frege Hilbert controversy um, about uh, whether consistency implies existence. And they're really asking themselves the question of whether the completeness theorem uh, can be regarded as a piece of finitary mathematics or a piece of set theoretic or ideal mathematics. And um, this is, of course, really before the development of computability theory or even the uh, arithmetical hierarchy. But Bernays explicitly asked the question, uh, which we would now put as follows, is the Gödel completeness theorem um, computably true? So would it continue to hold if we restricted to uh, uh, recursive models or models all of whose predicates are defined by double zero one sets. He asked this question explicitly. He conjectures a negative answer to it. But then if you look at what happens really immediately after the war, when people like Kreisel start reading the Grunlagen closely, you see that this is what leads to, in turn, the uh, Kreisel, Schoenfeld, and low basis theorems. OK, so um, turning now to uh, a few even briefer remarks about predicativism. I think Steve covered this uh, quite extensively in his talk. Um, so if our goal is to um, assess the plausibility of uh, arguing for equivalences between these foundational programs and particular axiomatic systems, then the historical uh, picture here is much more complicated because um, rather than there being just one or two original authorities for the standpoint, there are indeed many. And you know, there are just a list of, you know, whatever the 50 names that one could historically associate with uh, the words predicativity or predicativism, and they don't necessarily uh, agree on everything. So it's you know unclear perhaps what the thing that we're supposed to be analyzing, known as predicativism, is really supposed to be. But then one observation that then I think is um, important to the development of reverse mathematics is Kreisel's observation that um, predicative definability and predicative uh, provability uh, are prima facie distinct notions and they may their analysis may lead to uh, different uh, formal axiomatic systems. And then I think you can tell sort of separate interesting uh, stories uh, about the road essentially from ACA not, which it seems that everyone sort of read into Vial's Das Continuum, and you can see, uh, right, uh, sort of premonitions of this in particular formal systems that were proposed by people like uh, Gorgorczak and Mostowski in the 1950s. So how do we get from there, um, say, to uh, Delta 1-1 comprehension? 
Well, um, here, uh, Kreisel, in another, um, what I would really say is a truly classic paper from uh, also published in 1950, but in French, La Particativité um, gives what I would take to sort of be this gem of uh, a philosophical argument that predicative definability is correctly analyzed by delta 1, 1 definability over omega models. And what uh, a very brief sketch of his argument is that, uh, well, there are two ways of making sense of a predicative set of natural numbers. Um, on the one hand, a set that can be generated uh, inductively from the bottom um, from already existing sets. Um, and he uh, thinks that the definition of the hyperarithmetical sets, right, that Kleene had given just a few years earlier, is a way of conceptually uh, cashing this out. And he actually says so uh, several times in print. So, in other words, being hyperarithmetical is a sufficient condition for being predictably uh, definable. But then in Poincare, he also uh, locates this other characterization of predictivity in terms of invariance um, or uh, right, invariance with respect to changing other stuff in the domain. So what we would now identify as absoluteness. And then right, Kreisel is observing that uh, relative to omega models, delta 1, 1 definitions are absolute. So then delta 1, 1 definability, according to him, is a necessary condition for um, right, uh, predictive definability. So by Kleene's uh, theorem that the hyperarithmetical sets correspond to the delta 1, one sets, um, we get the analysis of um, predictive definability um, as delta 1, 1 definability via a so-called squeezing argument. That's something that Benedict's going to talk about further on Thursday. Situation um, from uh, ACA naught to ATR naught is, I would say, in fact, considerably more complicated, more interesting, and more technical, and um, almost to the extent that I really want to say as little as possible about it. But here, I guess one can identify uh, different pathways that lead uh, on the one hand um, to Pfefferman's, or really semantically defined by Kleene, the, um, hype, the, 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 the semantic characterization of ramified analysis then axiomatized by Pfefferman, um, then to, uh, of course, the proof theoretic ordinal of Pfefferman's axiomatization, um, gamma naught, the least uh, or the non-autonomous ordinal, um, at least uh, well ordering that you can't prove is a well ordering in the system. Um, and then also to uh, Pfefferman's system uh, IR, which Steve briefly mentioned. And then there's maybe another um, I, yet more involved and more technical, but maybe the most interesting route um, from the effectivization uh, of reasoning about ordinals and Borel sets leading to Borel codes and descriptive set theory, particular the formalization of Lucent's theorem, which can at least maybe in an ad hoc sense um, maybe not so ad hoc, be seen as leading to ATR not. And then we have the conservativity theorems, um, right, uh, that Steve was alluding to, and the potential for the development or the right formulation of a predicative reductionist program. But I'll leave that aside. I now, um, I'm sure I'm exhausting my time quickly, just want to move to the first half of what Benedict and I jointly want to say about set existence. And so first, one slide of background, again, from sort of the center center of uh, contemporary philosophy of mathematics, or really 20th century philosophy of mathematics at first. And again, maybe people with uh, in philosophy with interest in um, reverse math and computability theory aren't really in the center of the subdiscipline. But in any event, a preoccupation of 20th century philosophy of mathematics has been the ontological commitments of mathematical theories. So in other words, uh, if we I, uh, take the um, existential theorems of the theories at face value, is telling us that certain kinds of things have to exist, say, per Frege and Quine, then um, we can ask what kinds of uh, mathematical objects have to be have to exist in order for certain mathematical theories to be true or satisfied, um, right? Maybe, right, if we're just talking about PRA, it's just, right, unary numerals or stroke notations. Uh, but then as we go up, right, if it's PA, maybe it's all of the natural numbers. 
If it's said two, maybe it's the power of the natural numbers and we ascend right to Germano set theory and beyond. Um, but philosophers have found uh, two uh, aspects of this troubling. On the one hand, right, they are much exercised with the abstractness of the math of mathematical objects, right? For instance, the fact that they're outside of space and time. And uh, right, on the other hand, uh, they've also been concerned um, with the fact that as we ascend in uh, strength, right, proof theoretically, um, of course, um, the kinds of objects that we're positing um, have larger and larger cardinality and, you know, are perhaps more remote from us in some sense. So those have been kind of preoccupations of the 20th century. Um, in the early 21st century, we now have a recognized subdiscipline in uh, philosophy of mathematics called the philosophy of set theory. And um, the major point that I want to drive home here is that at least from our perspective, you might think that this uh, right, di subdiscipline would be very interested in set existence as it's understood in philosophy of math, or sorry, in reverse mathematics. But in many ways, we think that it really isn't because the kinds of questions that philosophers of set theory are interested in, um, right, sort of the backward looking ones are still lots of debates about set theory versus second order logic versus plural logic versus type theory, say vis-a-vis -vis resolution of the semantic and set theoretic paradoxes. Um, also, again, slightly backward looking, but um, you know, the iterative hierarchy and how, what axioms does reflection on it justify. Um, but then maybe in terms of more contemporary topics, um, there are of course lots of debates uh, these days about what's known as set theoretic pluralism. And maybe these can be divided in debates about how tall or, or high the universe is in regard to uh, justification of large cardinals uh, and uh, reflection principles and how wide it is. And this does touch a little bit on um, right, forcing versus determining the axiom. So actual contemporary set theoretic practice. But if that's a fair characterization of what philosophers have been interested in, we observe that really none of this uh, engages with set existence as it has traditionally been understood in reverse mathematics. Because the worries of course are about the ontology or size cardinality of the objects and maybe uh, truth and reference with respect to the area of hierarchy. And there's been little to no concern um, outside of very specialized settings um, with a relative uh, or absolute um, definability or computability theoretic properties of subsets of the natural numbers. And so now this is my beginning of a uh, handoff uh, or segue over to Benedict. Um, but I just want to say one thing about a topic that is in a way near to my heart, but I think is the characteristic of the kind of detailed uh, technical development that just sort of calls out for a philosophical scrutiny and a foundational story that comes up in a verse mathematics about which there's very little that's been written. So again, um, I would say that there is indeed a notion of set existence that's particular uh, to reverse mathematics in a right, historically salient way. I mean, we recall maybe that we get the term set existence from the Gandhi, Kreis, uh, Gandhi, Kreisel, and Tate paper, which the GKT basis theorem is proved, I guess, also in 1960. But we philosophers won't really be able to uh, engage much further with that until we sort of catch up on some computability theory and hyperarithmetical theory. So on my view, we really won't make much progress until maybe you should have follow up on meetings with titles such as computability theory and its philosophy, hyperarithmetical theory and its philosophy, effective descriptive set theory and its philosophy. But I'll just close by maybe just um, right, uh, gesturing again in more detail at basis theorems as a potentially interesting subject for philosophical reflection. What is a basis theorem? Well, by way of review schematically, it's a statement that says for all uh, I hate, uh, definitions in a certain formula class, say gamma, um, if uh, there is some function or set that satisfies that definition in that formula class, then there already exists one in a right, uh, class B, the so-called basis for that class, potentially of a much lower complexity. And I'll close by just um, quickly reading or pointing to these 
two quotes from uh, a couple of Clini's paper where the notion of a basis is introduced. Um, so in attempting to make foundations of analysis more constructive, one may attempt in various situations to replace the uncountable infinity of number theoretic functions by a countable class of such functions. It is thus of interest to inquire how large a class may, be, may necessarily be in a given situation. Using terminology suggested by Kreisel, a class B is a B of functions is a basis for the formula class gamma of predicates of a function variable if for every predicate dot 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 and then he states the familiar definition. Um, the second one maybe is even uh, I would say more pregnant. A definition of the as it turns out, sigma one one form with the class B as a basis is of course not the same as the definition with B as a range for the function variable F. In the definition with B as a basis rather than merely as a range, the class B enters only as a lower bound. The definition means this, and this is wait, what philosophers, the kind of thing that philosophers tend to like in quotes. The definition means the same thing to persons with various universes of functions, so long as each person's universe includes at least uh, the basis B, of which we may have no exact conception. So um, I will then uh, try to, as smoothly as possible, unshare my screen and hand over to Benedict. 